Good morning. Good to be with you. It is so good to be back here at Washington Avenue. And I am so excited about being here and talking about this topic this morning. Last night we were looking at Jesus, who the true Jesus is. This morning we're going to shift from who He is to what He has done for us. So I've been given the title, God's Awesome Blessings in Jesus. I think that's an especially appropriate title for me as I think about Washington Avenue. As I think about Washington Avenue, I think about God's blessings for me in this church family. I am thankful for being here this, this weekend to be able to speak with some people I, I look up to. Someone like Kirk Brothers that, as he mentioned last night, I was a part of his future preacher's camp. Columbia, Tennessee, back in 2008. And we have maintained a relationship through the years, even him coming to Freed Hardeman when I was there. And I just respect him so much. I respect Rick. I don't know him very well. Met him a couple year, years ago, but I've admired him from afar. And after last night, after hearing what his, his former profession was, I can really say, I really think he's the bomb. I really do. Now, I've been waiting to detonate that all night, but you know, I'm just glad it didn't blow up in my face, so maybe that will wake you up this morning. But sincerely, from our heart, we're thankful for being here. We're thankful for what you have done for me and my family through the years, what you did for Bethany and her family in a difficult time as they were in Evansville, and also bringing me on in 2010 to be your summer intern, and how much love you have shown us, and those rela relationships continue. And that's the beautiful thing about God's people, is these relationships continue through the years. I see many of the Washington Avenue people spread around here and there, and always run across one or two here, here and there. And uh, we've even had two interns at the church I preach at, from Washington Avenue, both named Michael, Michael Shiflett and Michael Bush. And they have done an excellent job that now my elders are saying, hey, go to Washington Avenue, find us another Michael and make sure that we can have another good intern. So uh, if you all do have a Michael, let me know afterwards. But it's so good to be here talking about God's awesome blessings in Jesus. Do you believe that God's blessings are awesome? Now I know we use the word awesome for, for everything. Oh, that was an awesome pizza. That was an awesome night's rest. Oh, that t-shirt is awesome. We use that very casually in our day and time. What I'm getting at, though, by talking about God's awesome blessings in Jesus, is are we taken aback by God's blessings? Are we someone that, that is, is rendered speechless because of what God has done for us? Are we someone who is, is amazed by what God has done for us in Christ Jesus? I would have to say in my own life that I'm not always a person who has, has that awe captured in my heart. It's easy to get in those routines that, yes, I, I pray to God and I thank Him for my day, I thank Him for my family, I thank Him for, for what He's done for me in Jesus, but, but sometimes that just gets routine and, and I lose that awe in my heart. Now, I know feelings in, in spirituality aren't everything. They are not everything. However, what we find time and time again throughout the Scriptures is when someone was in awe of God and of His blessings, of His holiness, of His power, of His grace and mercy, that they bowed down before God and worshipped Him. Whether that's Isaiah 6 that Rick mentioned last night, or there in Isaiah 6, he's in the throne room of God, he sees the holiness of God, and he falls on the floor before God. Or that's in the book of Jonah. And we see these sailors throw Jonah off, off the boat, and this tumultuous sea is calmed. And there it says they sacrificed and worshipped God. Or maybe in the New Testament when we see Jesus healing the man who was born blind, this man finally finds out the person who had the power to heal his blindness, that he bowed down and worshipped Jesus. Or the Apostle Thomas in John chapter 20, when he sees Jesus for the first time from in his resurrected body, as he saw him there in the flesh, he said those classic lines, my Lord and my God. Or whether it's in Revelation, verses four, chapters 4 and 5, so we get this, this scene in heaven. We see these heavenly beings bow down before the one who sits on the throne and the one who is the Lamb. And they give thanks to God. 
And they praise him for he is worthy. Yes, feelings aren't everything in spirituality, but, but when we have that awe in our lives, it captivates us and it inspires us to be humble before God, to bow down before him and to worship him and to give him thanks. And so I genuinely believe we need that awe, that awe in our spiritual lives in order for us to be pleasing to God. And I believe we see that here in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 10, we see here that Paul is describing how we can walk in a worthy manner before God so that we can be fully pleasing before the Lord. And as he does so, he gives us, and in the Greek it's four different participles, four different descriptions of, of how we can be pleasing before God. The four things that he says there is that we can be pleasing to God when we bear fruit in every good work. He says, second, that we can please God by increasing in our knowledge of God. Third, he says, we can be pleasing to God by, by being strengthened by God so that we endure the tests that we face and to endure them with joy. And then finally, what he says is that we are pleasing to God when we give thanks before the Lord. And that's the one we're really going to hit home this morning as we think about God's blessings. We need to think about how we can take those blessings and give thanks to God for it. Following this, this, this passage, we see, starting in verse 12 all the way to 23, Paul continues to describe to these Christians reasons that they can give thanks to God, reasons they can be thankful in Jesus. And I think that's a very important thing for us to note here as we think about being all of God and giving thanks to Him, that all of that is grounded in our knowledge of what Jesus has done for us. It all has to go back to our knowledge. I know a lot of people in religion nowadays, they try to have awe of God from an emotional worship service, or maybe from, from something that's like a, an inner gut feeling within their heart, to say, oh, God is real. Now what we find in the scriptures time and time again is when we have that knowledge of God, it inspires that awe, and that awe turns into thanks of God. That's what we see in verses 9 and 10 as he says that he's praying for them, that they may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that they can walk worthily before the Lord. We've got to have knowledge that precedes that awe and that giving of thanks before our God. And what here Paul says, the foundation of that, that, that knowledge, the foundation of that awe and thanks comes back to this, this center point of this book of where we would be without Jesus. Where would we be without the Lord Jesus Christ? I would imagine most of us in our life would say there are very influential people in our lives that, that we truly believe that if, if they were not involved in our lives, we would be in a very difficult situation. That we would be in a dark place without these people. Whether it, it might be our parents, maybe it's a, a Christian mentor, maybe it's your spouse. I think about me and my ministry, I think back to my time here, and I, I ask myself often, where would I be without the care and love of, of Alan and Stephen and, and how they were so good to me this summer, that summer? How they were so good to teach me about ministry. Where would I be in ministry without them? We often ask that question, where would I be without this person or that person? Well, none of those people can compare to where we would be without Jesus. Because that, without Jesus, we would be in a very dark and hopeless place. And Paul reminds the Colossians of this. There in chapter 1, in verse 21, he says this, and you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He says you were hostile. You were enemies of God. You were alienated from the Lord. Further in chapter 3, chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, he says this, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming, and these you too once walked when you were living in them. He says, this is your life. 
This is what your life was without Jesus. You were, you were living according to the worst of human nature. You were living a wicked life, and because of that, you were headed on a path that leads to destruction. You're headed for the wrath to come. He says, that's what you were without Jesus. Now, Kirk, last night, he brought up a very important parallel to the book of Colossians, and that is Ephesians. In Ephesians, we get some of the same language, same language directed towards the Gentiles of where they were without God. And he says there in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we're by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. He says, you were dead. You were dead in your trespasses. And you were headed towards the second death. He reminds them of that in verse 12. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. See, without Jesus, we are in a very, very difficult situation. We are in a very dark place, a place without hope, a place where we have no hope of what's going to happen after this life. But what we find time and again in this book is that Jesus, Jesus took that, that wicked, alienated self, a self that was without hope, and he turned that absolutely around. And he did that. He turned that around by dying on the cross for our sins. Read with me there in chapter 1, verses 19 through 20. It says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. There's a reference to his incarnation. He came as flesh and, verse 20, through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And so here what we find is that, that we were alienated from God. We were hostile to God. However, God made that step of reconciliation towards us. And he did that by sacrificing his son on the cross. Now normally when we have disputes among one another, when we have problems with other people, whenever someone offends someone else, we expect that person to come and apologize. If someone were to offend me, I would expect them to come and say, I'm sorry, I messed up, I'm going to right this wrong, I'm going to mend this wound, and I'm going to do better in the future. That's what we expect, that the offending party would try and make amends. But that's opposite of how it is with God. Because we were the ones who were hostile to God. We were the ones, as, as Romans 5 says, we were enemies of God. That's what we were. We were enemies of the Lord. And what happened? What happened is God took that first step of reconciliation by offering His Son to die for us. Now usually what happens in a, some type of a relationship that we have that, that kind of gets all tangled up and, and we rub shoulders and we get angry with one another is, is that most, most of the time when we have these interpersonal problems is that both people have some part in that conflict. They have some blame, and they could both say, I'm sorry. But that is not true. It is never true about God because God is holy. He is perfect. He has done nothing wrong. And even though He hasn't done anything wrong, He made that step to bring us back into a relationship with Him, to bring us back so that we can have peace with Him. How amazing is it that God took that first step even before we even asked for forgiveness. But he wanted to forgive us. He wanted to reconcile with us even before we ever thought to ask for, for His forgiveness. In fact, as I think about myself, and I know how stubborn I am, I would imagine that if God had not taken that first step with Jesus, I probably wouldn't have taken that first step on my own. I probably thought, oh, my sin's not that big of a deal, and I can live without God. I can just enjoy life. And make life all about me. However, the cross, the cross and Jesus dying on that cross, it interrupts that thought process. 
Because as he dies on the cross, he shows us how serious our sin truly is. That we deserve to drink the cup of God's wrath. But Jesus, he drank that for us. He drank that for us. He took on his punishment on himself. And not only does it show that God is serious about sin, but it shows that he's serious about each one of us. That he pursues us. He seeks after us to bring us back so that he can have peace and that we can have peace with him again. How beautiful is that? That we, in our past of being hostile to God, that God has taken that first step and offered us offers us that reconciliation through Jesus so that we can be reconciled to him. That even though we were sinners, and we were the ones who were the offenders, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. How beautiful that truly is that our present reality has changed because God took that first step and loved us so much to say, I want a relationship with you, warts and all. Despite what you've done, I want to be in a relationship with you. It is truly amazing how God took that first step when we were his enemies, when we were hostile and alienated from him because of our deeds, because of our sins, because we turned our back on him. But not only did he change our present reality, what we find in the scriptures is also he has changed our future reality. See, the relationship that we can have through Jesus, it starts now, but it can last forever and ever and ever and ever. It can last in eternity with God. And that's what Paul says here in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12. He says, The Father has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Again, remember where they were before. They didn't have an inheritance before. They were alienated from the promise of the covenant. They were alienated from God. And plus, can we really blame God for not giving us an inheritance when we were still his enemies? We don't leave inheritances to our enemies. We leave inheritance to our friends and to our family members. We don't do it for people who are hostile towards us. But here in Jesus, that hostility is put away. And now God looks at us differently. And he looks at us not as enemies anymore, but he looks at us as family members. He looks at us as his children. We are the children of God who receive his inheritance. That is truly amazing that we have been brought in to be his family. But also it's important for us to realize where we would have gone if we were not right with God. What would have happened to us if we kept going down the path that we were on? What the scriptures say over and over again is those who do not turn to God and accept his reconciliation, accept his forgiveness, that those people are headed on a path that leads to destruction. Jesus calls this place hell. It's a place where there is unquenchable fire, where the worm does not stop, where there's gnashing of teeth, where they are in outer darkness. The book of Revelation says that this is a place where, where day and night the smoke goes up forever. And it does not cease, and there is no rest. And there is a place of fire and sulfur. This is a horrible place that none of us would ever want to spend one minute, much less eternity. We would never want to spend any time in hell. But that's what Jesus saves us from. He saves us from that. He snatches us from the fire. But not only does he do that, which in of itself would have been enough, amen? To be saved from hell. That, that would be enough. But then he gives us grace upon grace. He gives us this inheritance, which is an eternity. Eternity at the face of God in his very presence. To live with him forever and ever. That is truly amazing what he has given us by offering us that eternal home with him. Yes, we might not be able to see God face to face in our day and time. But we will dwell face to face with him forever and ever. And it's a place, a place that we could never have earned on our own. It's a place that it says here that the Father qualified us. We don't earn it by our own good works. We receive it because 
of grace. Because God loves us so much. And he wants to spend eternity with all of us. And so when we think about Jesus, we need to understand that he has has changed our future reality. He's taken away that wrath. And he's given us the hope of spending eternity with him. As we think about the, the, the true Jesus this weekend, it's especially important for us to realize that these pagan believers, they were worshiping other gods. They were falling after other religions. But it's only in Jesus that we have this hope. It's only in Him alone, not any other religion, any religion from their past or any religion in our world today. It's only through Jesus. As Jesus says in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's what He says. He is an exclusive Lord. And if we want Him to change our present, be reconciled to God, and if we want Him to change our future and have eternal hope with Him, that it can only, it can only come through Jesus. Now, as we think about these amazing blessings, sometimes it's hard for us. It's hard for us to really grasp if these blessings are real for our lives. You know, even though we know that that God promises these blessings and He offers those blessings, a lot of times because of our imperfect lives, we think to ourselves, we can never truly receive these blessings. We think to ourselves, well, I've done so much wrong. Satan seems to have my number. I mean, I'm just getting pounded all the time. How in the world is God going to give me these awesome blessings? Has God really forgiven me? Can I actually make it to heaven? See, a lot of times we live in this this realm of doubt. We're unsure if we can really have these awesome blessings. But even at that, I think what we find here in Colossians can give us encouragement. And not only are these, these, these blessings awesome, but they're also real. They're also something that we can have ourselves. We see they are starting in Verse 13, something that changes our present reality. As we think about our walk with God, it says there, He, meaning God, has delivered us from the domain of darkness, transformed us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Here in this passage, what we have is it's a lot of Exodus language. We here have the word delivered, as God delivered the, the, the Israelites from the hand of the Egyptians, from slavery, He led them across the Red Sea. We also see the word here, redemption, which in the ancient world it had the connotation of, of purchasing a slave at a slave trade situation, where you would have to pay money to purchase that slave, to set that slave free. And what we have here is it's speaking about God transferring us from that domain, that, that power, that oppression of darkness into the kingdom of His Son. It's he's saying that He has set us free. He has set us free from the slavery of sin. He has set us free so that we can be servants of Him. And He's paid that ransom. He paid that ransom through Jesus. The only way that he was able to pay that ransom through Jesus was because he was the perfect, the perfect sacrifice for our sins. There's no other sacrifice for our sins that can make us have the realities and the blessings of God other than Jesus' sacrifice for our sins. That perfect sacrifice for us, for our eternity, for our relationship with the Lord. But one thing we often miss, I think, in this passage is that not only does God save us from the consequences of our sin, but He also saves us from the slavery and the power over us that sin often has. We often feel this oppression, whether it's in addiction or it's in a secret sin, that, that we feel like this sin is reigning over us and we don't have a chance to get out of that situation. We don't have a chance to get out of that oppression that darkness reigns over us. That we feel like we are helpless before the evil beings around us and helpless when it comes to our sins. Sometimes we feel like we're just pounded constantly by 
darkness. But what we find in this passage, what we find in this passage is that Jesus has delivered us from that slavery. He has delivered us from that power that, that Satan has over us. It says there in Colossians chapter 2, in verse 15, again speaking about what Jesus' death did for us. It says that God, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Him, in Jesus. So we know, when we think about the spiritual forces, the evil forces all around us, we need to know that the cross, the cross put them to open shame. That the cross triumphed over them. That God disarmed these powers that are around us and has given us an opportunity to unshackle, unshackle those, that sin that, that often binds us and to give us a possibility to live for Him. We see a similar passage in Romans chapter 6. As he's talking about slavery to sin. He says, We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. That was God's purpose, is to make, make it where we do not have to live in that wickedness and that slavery and that darkness that reigns over us. But He has set us free. He has disarmed these rulers, and then He has given us spiritual weapons in order to fight against these spiritual works of darkness. And the biggest and the greatest gift He has given us is the gift of Himself. That God is dwelling in us because we have accepted Christ at baptism. We have been buried with Christ. That we are raised in order to have God living in each one of us. And because of that, we have hope. That we're not burdened by the slavery of sin anymore, but we're set free and given a fighting chance against the evil forces that are around us. John says it this way in 1 John 4 and verse 4. He says, He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Because God dwells within us and he has defeated these powers, we now have a fighting chance. We now have a possibility to overcome sin and temptation in our life. We're able to do that because of Jesus. Because Jesus died on the cross. He disarmed the powers. And now he lives in each one of us. He dwells in each one of us as we try to live a life that is worthy before the Lord. And with God's help, God's help in our present reality of, of trying our best to overcome sin and using His help and using the armor of God to fight against Satan and the evil forces, I believe because He has given us and empowered us in the present, He has also given us assurance that when we stand before God in the future, when we stand before His throne on Judgment Day, that we can go home to be with Him forever. Again, what we find in this passage is that is why Jesus came to earth and died for our sins. Colossians chapter 1, in verse 22 and 23, it says, He who is now reconciled in His body of flesh by His death. So Jesus died in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before Him. That's the purpose Jesus came. So that we all can stand holy and blameless and without reproach before God one day. That's why He died. Now if Jesus didn't think we could do that, would He have died? I don't believe so. He would have only died if He actually believed that it would have worked. It would have restored our relationship with God. God would have actually forgiven us, yes, even in the worst of sins, and that He can help us and guide us so that we one day will be with Him forever and ever. Yes, I know we often don't think of ourselves as holy and blameless. Two words that are used in the Old Testament of sacrifices. Sacrifices that were offered to God that were supposed to be without spot. And then this last word, above reproach. It's a judicial term, a term that has to do with, with having an accusation against you. It says we will we'll be without accusation before the Lord on the judgment day. That's how He wants to present us before God. You've got to believe that if God has, was willing to go through all that to send Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, that He is willing, 
He is willing to help us to get to heaven. Amen? That if, if, if we truly believe that God has saved us and wants to save us, then we should have enough faith that God can help us be saved forever and ever. So we have to have that faith. Have to have the faith. Yes, we sin. Yes, we mess up. He's not asking for a perfect life. What he's asking for us to do is to continue in Jesus. Look there, verse 23, where it says this. If, indeed, you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. He doesn't say you have to be perfect. He says you have to continue in your faith. Yes, that requires us repenting of sin. It requires us overcoming sin. It requires us defeating sin in our lives. But it doesn't mean that we have to be perfect. It doesn't mean we have to be sinless. It does mean we have to sin less. It does mean we have to remain in the realm of Jesus, in that saving realm of what He has given us through His death on the cross. And so as we think about God's awesome blessings, please understand that not only are they awesome, but they are certainly and truly real. Have you ever come against something that just seemed a little too good to be true? Maybe you got that phone call from Publishers Clearinghouse, or, or maybe you thought you won the lottery. I remember back to uh, a sitcom when I was growing up, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. There in the 90s, there was a pretty popular show, and Will Smith, the, the uh, main character in the film, convinced his butler, Jeffrey, that he had won the lottery, that he took his numbers from the day before and put them together in a ticket and then recorded the lottery numbers from the day before. And Jeffrey actually thought that he had won the lottery. He gets real excited. He he dances on the couch. He's so excited. He quits his job. He's so excited. But then he later finds out that it was too good to be true. There was a reason to be skeptical, that it really wasn't true at all. And for us in our Christian life, we are not going to end up like Jeffrey. We truly have struck the lottery, something greater than the lottery, in God's blessings in Jesus. And sometimes we become Christians and we're like, yes, this is so great, and we celebrate. But then we start sinning, messing up, and realizing it's difficult to live a Christian life, and we, we kind of get disappointed, and we, we kind of get skeptical if God's really going to come through with His blessings, if He has really forgiven us, and if He really is going to give us that hope in heaven. However, what we're reminded throughout the book of Colossians is this, is that Jesus' death, it shouts to us that God wants us to have His blessings. That God wants us to have those blessings in Jesus. That's what His death says to us. That He wants it so desperately. He wants it for us and for Him to have a relationship now and forever. But not only does His death offer that to us, it's not like those those times when you you see people put those practical jokes where they have a dollar bill and they put a hook on it and they kind of use a a reel to kind of reel that that piece away. God's not just offering us that thing and just reeling away where we can never grab it. No, that's not Him. Instead, He wants us to have His blessings, and He's willing to help us to have those blessings if we just follow Jesus, if we just live in Jesus, if we just truly abide in Jesus. How truly awesome is it that each one of us can have the awesome blessings of Christ because of what Jesus has done for us? How amazing. And as we think about this lesson, I hope what it does for us is to see that that not only are God's blessings awesome, but they're real. And each one of us can have it in our lives. And from that, take away a sense of awe within our hearts. How much God loves us and cares for us and wants us so deeply to live with Him forever. And I hope that that all will create a thanksgiving within our hearts where we are constantly praising our God who has done so much for us in Christ Jesus. 
And I believe as we think about the true Jesus this weekend, as we think about all the the fakes in the world and who the true Jesus is, that all within our heart and that thanksgiving on our tongue constantly reconfirms to us time and time again that there is only one way that we're saved. There's only one way that we're reconciled to God. There's only one way that we're saved from the wrath to come. There's only one way that we have eternal life, and that is only through Jesus of the Bible. That is the only way that we can have these blessings. That's the only way that they are real for each one of us. And I hope that our Thanksgiving reminds us constantly to stay in Jesus. He's our only hope. He's our only Savior. He's the only one that can reconcile us to God and give us an eternal home with God forever. How beautiful and awesome that truly is. Let's pray together. Dear God, our Father, we're thankful, Lord, for what you have done for us in Jesus and how you did that for us when we were in a sinful state, when we were wicked and and far apart from you, alienated, hostile in mind, living out great wickedness in our life, that, that you saved us through all that. You took that first step. Even though you you had done nothing wrong, you took that step and and you sacrificed so much by sending Jesus to die for our sins. Thank you, Lord, for acting first on our behalf. And thank you, Lord, for offering us in our lives through the gospel this uh, ability to be reconciled with you. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to take that step if we haven't done that as soon as possible, to be reconciled with you, to have peace with you, so that we can have a, a life that has purpose, in our time, in our present, so that we can be close to you and walk with you as our creator, but also so that we can spend eternity with you forever and ever. Help us, Lord, to know that we can do it. We can get to heaven. We can be reconciled to you because you are with us. That even in our sin, even in our our stumbling here and there, that you are helping us and forgiving us and blessing us. And if we just trust in you, that you will see us through. Help us to have that faith, Lord. The one who can save us is also the one that can keep us saved and help us along this journey with you. Help us, Lord, to have that focus in our mind and understand that none of this, none of this could be done without Jesus. And for that, we are in awe of and we give you thanks. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.